And this is at a tour. This is with the Oprah tour that I was on earlier this year. Amen. So, there we go. Wait for that to go, and I and I'll keep going. Um, so, math is also a language, um, and it's the language of structure and organization and consistency. You may feel uh, one way on a given day, and you may feel another way on another day. Matter of fact, if you're if we're talking about music, the same song might be, might make you feel two different ways depending on how you play them. But things like one plus one equals two is always true forever, um, and so things that a lot of what is permanent about life, not everything, but a lot of what is permanent about life, like nature or science, um, is expressible in mathematics. Um, and communication in this language, rather than hitting your emotions, um, gives you the source of structure in society. So like all of modern technology and architecture um, and that kind of thing, engineering, this all is expressed in mathematics. Um, and it's a lot of fun to play around because you understand why things are the way they are when you see, you know, things in the outside world, why they work um, or why things don't work. Um, and so my pro uh, uh, and so like there's a there's a difference. Part of the problem is that there's a huge difference in lifestyle. Um, as a mathematician, uh, you're sitting down um, or maybe walking around. You're by yourself. You can't be by yourself a lot of times or in a small group or team. Um, and you're studying and thinking deeply about patterns and relationships and abstract ideas. Um, whereas the musician lifestyle consists of traveling around the world, meeting a lot of people, um, and also a lot of solitary time learning an instrument. But I felt like I was being torn apart. Um, and the problem was that if I tried to live only as a musician, well, my love of you know understanding this kind of permanent, indelible truth would pull me back to mathematics. But the world of music was so beautiful and exciting, and I couldn't put that away. Anytime I would try, I'd keep getting drawn back. I'd get another call to go on another tour, another exciting thing would happen to me. Um, and so I couldn't leave that alone. So being, being a mathematician full-time or a musician full-time is very, very difficult. Um, and, and to be competitive in these industries pretty much takes all that you have. Um, so I had this problem to solve, um, is that I had two separate parts of me that didn't really add up to the whole. So usually when I have these kinds of problems to solve, um, uh, I meditate on it. So meditation is something that I do um, and that, that I find to be very important. And um, to, the simplest version is, you know, I sit quietly for, for long periods of time and I'll observe all my emotions, things that make me happy, things that, uh, things that make me insecure or sad or, or scared or uncomfortable, and I just let them sit. I don't try to push them away. I don't try to cover them up. I just kind of observe them, let them do their thing, um, and, and hold a place of observation. Um, and when I do that, uh, it offers me a, a certain guidance in uncertain times. So in particular, I meditated uh, regularly, kind of asking the unseen um, who kind of governs the meditation state, uh, how could I put these two parts of my life together? Um, and the unseen has a way of disentangling tricky problems. And this works for math problems, it works for life problems. It, it's always good to kind of sit and be quiet with yourself uh, for some time on a regular basis. But, you know, as I ponder this question, um, one day my family calls me up and says, hey, uh, we're visiting the National Museum of Mathematics uh, with your little sister for an educational trip. Um, you should come by. And so I went to the National Museum of Mathematics. It's in Madison Square Park in Manhattan. Um, and I'm walking through, and, uh, and, and I said to myself, man, I really want to play music here. There's no music program set up there, um, but I just enjoyed my time there so much and was so inspired by the place that, uh, you know, I decided, well, I, I, I want to play music there. So I reached out to the person who ran the museum, um, and I asked if I could put together a program. And as I was putting together uh, my first talk there, which was in 2017, 
um, I realized that I had a way to solve my problem. I had a way to put um, these parts of my life together. If I couldn't do um, math and music on their own, well, perhaps I could do them together, right? I could talk about the relationships between the two disciplines um, and what they mean to me and what they can offer to the world. Um, but then here was another problem. Um, this hasn't been done before. When I looked on the internet or when I looked around for you know, people who had studied math and music, there, were some, there was some information, but it didn't really talk about what the experience of, of doing math was or what the experience of doing music was and how those were related. It talked a lot about the kind of physics of sound, um, which has a lot of math in it um, and, is a, and is a fun topic. But um, I felt like if I was going to do that, I'd be retracing other steps. So I kind of had to figure out how I was going to work. Um, and how I was going to make this happen. And so, uh, and so now here's the part where, uh, where you can take notes if you want. I have a couple, of, uh, a couple of frameworks that are good for, that I found really helpful for solving problems. So this is uh, part one of Marcus's solve, problem solving trick. Um, step one, when you have a problem, you choose what you're going to work on and you commit to finishing. This seems like not that big a deal, but it's funny how in life a lot of times you can start something and then when it gets hard you don't finish it. But if you, if you commit yourself to say, no, I'm going to finish this no matter what, then life has a way of opening up and, and, um, and helping you along. Um, so commitment, um, choosing choice and commitment are really important. Um, second, you identify, and, you identify and activate what tools and resources you have to help you. Now, these tools and resources can be equipment that you have. If you're trying to learn to make music, maybe you have instruments in your house. You know, maybe if you, uh, if you go to church, if you play in church or something like that, there are instruments there. Um, and, uh, and you can go online if you want to learn to you want make YouTube videos. You can learn to video edit it on the Internet. But you also want to make sure that when you think about resources um, that can help you, you include people around you because people have a lot of knowledge um, and experiences that you, know, you may not expect them to have. But when you reach out to them and talk to them, you can learn a lot. And then step three, uh, momentum. You do the most super simple, easy to do action that pushes you forward. Sometimes when you have a big problem, like what I want to do in life, or, um, or say a, a large project that you're working on in school, you can, uh, for me, I would spend a lot of time maybe conceptualizing and thinking about, all right, what's the big picture? What does this mean? What does this mean in my life? And those are good things to think about, but they can kind of, uh, they can, you can kind of do that forever. You can get stuck in that world. So in order to start moving forward and getting things done, you take the most super simple, easy to do action, right? Whatever it is that you can get done in five minutes or 10 minutes, or maybe with a day's worth of work and it'll be done. And then things are different from what you did. Whereas if you're in your head too much, uh, things kind of stay the same. You may think differently, but nothing around you changes, and you're actually no closer to solving the, the, the problem. So action is really, really important. And so here's how I applied this framework to what I was working on. Um, so I decided to explore the intersection between math and music. And I said, you know, I have these interests. I'm going to be this guy. Um, and, you know, it's kind of scary because there are musicians who are really great musicians, and there are mathematicians who are really great mathematicians. And I worry, like, well, if I'm doing both, maybe I won't be, you know, great at the same level as, you know, my heroes and mentors in each of these fields. And I said, you know what, I don't care. Um, I'm going to I'm going to live here and I'm going to find what I have to offer and I'm going to offer it. Um, so first was the, the decision. And then uh, I identified resources. So I so I, I researched the topics to make sure I knew what I was talking about. Like I said, I started looking at what had been done in the fields of math and music, putting them together. Um, and I also kept up my skills in math and music um, so that in each field I could talk to people in the industry and you know, be able to hold a conversation, be able to offer something, be able to have perspective. Um, and that allowed me to get into rooms of people with a certain level of specialty so that I could learn from them. Um, and then the last thing is I reached out to friends and family for help in making the dream come true. And this included, uh, this included uh, people I asked to be, you know, to work with me on a team, be my manager, um, lawyer and accountant, and all the, those kinds of things that you need if you're if you're going to be a, a musician. As well as uh, reaching out to people to come through to shows. When I'd give presentations, I'd have other um, other artists, musicians, scientists come and speak with me. Um, and so I built a, a community and a network around this interest. So really finding and identifying and activating these resources. 
Brother Marcus? Yeah. Can you please um, share with, with our youngsters uh, who the brother is in the picture with you? Sure. So, <laughs> so, so right next to me is Quincy Jones. Um, Quincy Jones is probably the greatest music producer of the 20th century. Um, Quincy Jones has written music from the uh, that that was uh, popular in the swing era, through um, through in the 40s and 50s, up up until uh, up until I mean he's still writing music and mentoring musicians now. Um, but some of the things Quincy Jones was responsible for, he wrote for um, he wrote for Count Basie's band and Frank Sinatra. Um, he wrote several TV and film scores. Um, he wrote. Um, he was the producer for Michael Jackson's uh, three um, most legendary albums, which are Off the Wall, uh, Thriller, and Bad. Um, Thriller is still the, the highest selling album of all time. Um, and, uh, and in addition to finding and mentoring pretty much everybody in the music industry, I mean, he's an extremely powerful, influential person. He's also responsible for uh, the, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. He produced that. He's a, a lead on Vibe magazine. And he's still working with um, with really groundbreaking musicians and artists to this day. So I've had a chance to speak with him and meet with him. I was on a podcast uh, that his company put on talking about math and music. And, um, and yeah, so that that's Uncle Quincy. He's really a, an amazing person and a hero and mentor of mine. Um, so then, simple action consistently. And so this is ongoing. Every day I work to increase my understanding. Um, in my, you know, now that we're in quarantine, I have several instruments around, um, around in my room. I have my piano sitting next to me. I have my saxophone on the left. I have a bass, flute. I have all these instruments. I'm always constantly reading scores um, and, uh, and, and reading um, music. I grew up playing jazz music primarily, but I started to get interested in classical music. So I reached out to people I could study from in there. And now I read scores from uh, composers like Beethoven and Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, I listened to, I, I picked up a hand drum because I started listening to a lot of Afro-Cuban music and the, the rhythmic concept of that is, is very deep and profound and I wanted that to be in my musicianship. And I'm always studying math. Um, I have lots of, I have a, a, a pretty much a library of PDFs um, which are uh, just uh, documents, books based on basically, like basically electronic books um, on my computer on all topics in math and physics. I used to go through um, uh, Harvard and MIT oftentimes have their curricula and courses um, open and available to watch lectures or download lecture notes. So I've downloaded a lot, a lot of those and I study and work through those on a regular basis. Um, and that's just kind of like what I do, how, a lot of how I spend my time every day, um, developing these skills. I also spend a lot of time connecting with people in my field, looking for mentors, looking for collaborators, um, and looking for people I can, I can really build something wonderful with. Um, and who we can offer opportunities to each other. So it's not always easy, but it means that I have opportunities beyond my wildest dreams. And so me kind of getting to a point where I was known well enough uh, in this space meant that I was asked to play the saxophone on the Oprah 2020 Vision Tour, which is where I met um, so, many of these, so many of these remarkable people um, in the beginning of 2020. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, in the middle of that, I was invited to go perform at the World Economic Forum at Davos, which is a, which is a conference every year um, where uh, all of the most uh, the leaders of different of, of various industries, presidents of different countries, um, and uh, and and really just remarkable remarkable um, wealthy accomplished people all meet. And so that's where I met people like Jaden Smith, Wesley Snipes, um, the president of Ghana, like a, a, a bunch of people there. And all of that comes from, you know, this kind of work and, and really wanting to solve this problem and find something innovative uh, to bring to the table. Um, so simple action consistently um, is, is really the way forward. Um, it's work um, and, it's, and it's hard work, but when you're doing something that you're really passionate about and committed to, sometimes even though work can be tedious or long, it isn't painful. You don't feel like you're suffering doing that. Um, and, so, uh, and so it's work that I chose to do and so it's work that I'm excited to do. And so here's another uh, here's a, another problem solving trick, and this is a this is actually given to me by a mentor of mine from Princeton University. His name is Bill Massey, and he's a, a black man who graduated Princeton in 1975, uh, went to Stanford for his PhD in mathematics, um, graduated there, and worked at Bell Labs, which is the way we look at Google today as a major research institution as well as a website. 
um, is basically what Bell Labs was um, for much of the 20th century. So he worked there, and then um, he had written, he had published some papers that were groundbreaking in his area of probability theory, and um, and he was invited to uh, become a tenure track professor at Princeton University um, after his tenure at Bell Labs. So he's now a, a professor at Princeton and was a mentor of me while I was in a, while I was at school um, at Harvard. And so this is these are words of wisdom from him that I've taken both for trying to solve hard math problems as well as uh, life. And first is lots of complicated problems are really just simple problems stacked on top of one another. Take them one by one. So if any of, any of you guys are doing algebra and you're doing multi-step problems where you have to solve for x, well, there's a lot of things that you might have to do. And you might say solve for x, but look at all these numbers and symbols around it. That looks like a headache. I'm scared. Well, usually there's a simple problem like, all right, well, there's a lot of stuff going on, but let me subtract the two or let me divide by five or something like that. And as you work through the process, you can take these simple problems and these simple problems will allow you to solve complicated problems. Not all problems are like this, but a lot of them are. So this is a good approach. And then another, uh, another problem solving trick is this. If there's a hard problem that you can't solve yet, then there's probably also an easier problem that you can't solve yet. So try the easier problem um, and see where that takes you. Sometimes it'll give you insight into the harder problem. Sometimes it won't, but it'll give you insight into something else and you can go with it from there. So, uh, so those are kind of two um, life lessons that, uh, that I've taken from studying mathematics that have applied pretty much everywhere. Um, and yeah, so uh, then in talking about you know, wholeness um, and how to integrate different parts of your life to, to feel whole, um, here's my formula for that. Um, you want to have a clear body, mind, and heart. For that, I train in martial arts and I you know, meditate regularly. Um, you add that to having an imagination or vision. You have to have a sense of uh, what you want to do with your life. And usually for most people, having a goal and having something to strive for um, gives them motivation. And, um, and in the interim, as you're coming up with the vision, and it's always changing, you know, you're using your imagination. You're thinking about what could be possible that isn't possible right now. Um, then there's work and discipline, like I was saying, you have got to sit down and buckle down and do the work. And structuring your life um, is a uh, is a great way to um, is a great way to make that less painful and less arduous. And then um, other people, so your family, your friends, and your community, um, because they all empower you. Um, they all can make you. Uh, they all can push you forward and give you access to information and opportunities that you can't get. Even if you are, you know, ultra disciplined and work really hard and have a great vision, if you're just in your in a box by yourself all the time, um, then it never reaches out and people can't um, people can't uh, give to you and you can't give to others. So others really complete the cycle of what you have inside to offer it to the world. Um, and that's pretty much those. That's my presentation. Those are my thoughts. Um, so thank you so much for, for for listening. And now I guess we'll open it up for for question and answer. Looks like I'm frozen. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Marcus. Yeah. You frozen on that side, good brother? Very well. So yeah, we can we can do question and answer. Let me uh perfect. Looks like my Zoom is stuck on uh, stuck. Brother Marcus, are you trying to stop sharing your screen? All right. Looks like we're back. That's it. That's it. Well done. Well done. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Thank, Thank you. Brother. We appreciate it. So we've got we got we have tons of questions. I don't know if we're gonna be able to get to all of the questions, but we will try to so, get to uh, so there are a lot of questions in the chat. I was wondering if to get if you could take a look at 
you know, what questions or from the Q&A um, and just filter them through me? Yeah, um, so I believe, uh, Brother Rafiq, if you can, if you can go through the questions. Sure, yeah. yeah well, thank yeah. you for that. I'll, I'll pick out I'll pick out a few that it seem a bit more uh, kind of kind of sum up some of the other ones. Um, so we'll we'll kind of start with one that's a bit more macro. Someone wants to know how has uh, kind of being in quarantine affected your career? They wanted to know specifically positively or negatively. It may not be that binary, um, but they wanted to know how has quarantine affected you. Hello. Oh, can you not keep to Gissy, Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Brother Marcus, can you hear Brother Rafiq? No, I cannot. Oh, he and, and on my on my screen, it looks like he's on mute. Oh, that is fascinating. Um, yeah. So so the question was it, it was on a on a macro level. Um, someone wants to know how quarantine has affected your work, um, either positively, negatively or in other ways. Yeah. Um, for me, you know, we're, we're facing a, a really big tragedy in the world and a lot of things are going to change, um, especially in, as, a, as a musician, as a performing musician. But for me, quarantine has been quite wonderful, actually. Um, you know, thank, thank God, like all my family and friends are, are, are pretty good. Nobody's gotten very sick. Um, I haven't lost anybody that, that's been close to me. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm very much an inside person as much as I, you know, go out and do all these kind of cool things around the world. Um, I'm actually much, I'm actually happiest when I'm inside and I can work on learning instruments and creating music and, uh, and, and thinking, reading books um, and that kind of thing. Um, I'm in touch with, you know, several people who are very close to me on a regular basis. And that makes me feel uh, that that makes me feel socialized enough that I'm not you know, anxious to get out. Um, but yeah, I've learned new instruments. I've completed um, new pieces. There's a lot of work that, because I was running around, um, running around the world doing so many things, I didn't have time to sit down and finish and, and give the attention to that I wanted to, that I have all the time in the world now. And it's given me some time to think about what comes next. Um, the live music industry in New York in particular, but maybe in general, may not exist in the way that it did before. And um, and this is distressing. A lot of my musician friends have moved out of New York, um, are very sad, very scared. Um, and for me, it's like, well, you know, life, things in life happen. Um, and this is far outside of my control. So it's a question of how can I adjust and what do I want to go in my career next? Um, and, um, and how can I make that, you know, virus proof? Um, how can I make it so I don't need to be at a venue and a bunch of people show up in order for me to make the money that I want to make? Um, doing it. So, uh, so, you know, the opportunity to think about that in peace and quiet, you know, while the train isn't moving so fast and life isn't really hitting me has been really wonderful. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's been it's been mostly positive for me. So brother Marcus, can you hear me now? Oh, he still can't hear me. Oh, that's so interesting. This is the technology is <laughs> interesting. So uh, we should ask Sister Kaya's question about right. yeah, uh, Challenges that you face. Yeah, let's ask that. Um, all right. So Sister Kaya is asking if you faced any specific challenges in learning math and whether it would, you had a particular favorite subject during okay. the years. Yeah, so um, so I had I had a lot of challenges learning math. Um, one, so I liked math as a kid and my family, um, my you know, I grew up mostly with my father and he was very good at math. And, uh, and so, you know, he would, he would give me information and he would say, all right, well, read this. And he'd pull out some, you know, some, some textbook that he had or something that was way beyond, you know, where I was supposed to be in school, but I just read it and I'd enjoy it. And I had a teacher in fifth grade who was the same way, you know, he kind of saw how I was doing in his class and he would say, he would pull me aside after school and say, Hey, uh, check out this book. And it'd just be a book of some math. And, you know, I'd go home and work on it. And I didn't know that that was, you know, in fifth grade, that was a, that was a pretty advanced book that might've been like second year high school level book. And it gave me this book on um, theoretical physics uh, that was kind of a popular science book. You know, it wasn't full of all the equations, but you know, it had a lot of the information and I would just read it, you know, not knowing. But in sixth grade, I had this teacher who discouraged me. Um, and, uh, and I, and, and, you know, I can I can probably admit that as a kid I was probably a little bit of a know-it-all. I was probably a little bit too cocky, and that might have rubbed this teacher the wrong way. But I remember there's this one assignment where she had a method that she wanted us to do, um, 
on a homework assignment and I knew a faster method. I knew something that was a little bit more, uh, that was a little bit stronger and worked for me. And she, you know, when I gave it, gave her that assignment, she said, no, this is all wrong. Um, this isn't the way I said to do it. And so my reaction as a little kid um, was, well, I hate you and therefore I hate math. My way of getting back at you was to act like I don't like math anymore. And that, you know, set me back. Because ultimately, you know, what happened is that between, um, between middle school and college, you know, I didn't do as much math as I could have. And it would have been really fun for me if I had gotten over my argument and my disagreement with that teacher. Um, so when I got to school and I just decided to jump into math, well, one of the things that was hard about you know, the Harvard math department is that, uh, you know, these are all you know, very brilliant uh, very brilliant students. Um, many are like several generations of mathematicians. Some were kind of trained uh, trained in mathematics at a very high level at a very young age because they just showed certain gifts and promise. And so for me to sit in class with them was very challenging because I felt like I was last. I was you know in last place. Um, and I needed to catch up. Um, there are some. So so that was kind of my my biggest challenge in, in learning math is like kind of keeping pace and dealing with kind of emotionally how I felt how I felt about math over you know different periods of my life. But I will say that if you're trying to learn math now, um, one of the things you want to keep in mind a couple of tricks is uh, you want to do you want to do a lot of problems. Um, you want to solve problems and you can't get mad at yourself if you don't get them right. You just got to work through them until you do get them right. And the sense of and the sense of looking at a problem, being confused, working really hard on the problem, getting it wrong, that kind of thing, that can be very discouraging in mathematics. It can make you think like, oh, I'm, maybe I'm just not that smart, like this is not for me, that kind of thing. But really, for most things in life, the point of being confused and not knowing what to do, um, and pushing and deciding to push forward anyway, a lot of that that is the secret for really improving. Um, I feel like that now all the time when I meet musicians who are really great or mathematicians who are really great or just smart people. I'm just like, wow, I'm really out of class. I don't know what to do, but I kind of committed to growing anyway. And, um, and that, that helps a lot. Also, um, be really organized about how you write uh, things down on the page. From, go from like very high level to just very practical. Um, try to keep your lines evenly spaced so that when you're checking over your work, uh, you, can, you can understand what you wrote. Mm. So we have another question, uh, and Brother Rafiq, feel free to interrupt me uh, if, I'm, if I'm off. Uh, Sister Cincy is asking, if you had to give up one, would you choose math or music? And then also, what is the direct relationship between math and music? That's sure. exactly what I was going to um, ask. I've before. tried giving up both at different times in my life, and the rest of my life fell apart. I would just be really sad. Nothing would work. And this is, this is why it was so hard, because like you said, each of those is really hard. Math, professional mathematicians in general spend a lot of time in a PhD program where they're doing nothing but math, and they're around people who are doing nothing but math. And, um, if, and, and that meant that I couldn't be a musician. There was a time when I tried it. Um, I actually uh, enrolled in a, a physics course at Columbia, and I had so much fun learning that stuff, but I never slept because you know I'd be on a gig until 3 in the morning, and then i have to study. You know, and that's not sustainable. Um, I couldn't like never sleep and spend all the time I wanted to practicing and spend all the time I wanted to studying. Um, I wasn't that guy. So um, what I realized is I had to, in order for me to be happy and whole um, and not just kind of dysfunctional and anxious and mad all the time, um, is I had to find a way to make them both come together. So, uh, so when you ask um, if I had to give up one, um, I, I, I choose the middle path. I reject the uh, I reject the notion that I have to be one or the other, um, and uh, and and I'll take the concept and, I, and the sacrifice is trying to find my way in a place that's not really clear on how to do it. Um, the direct relationship between math and music for me there are a lot of them. Um, for me, it's the sense of it's the workflow, it's the creativity, it's the dropping into this intellectual zone. Um, if I'm working on uh, a composition, right. And I'm, what, what am I doing basically? I'm sitting at my computer, I'm sitting over you know, some sheet music and a piano um, for several hours a day trying to figure out um, what actually feels good and what actually works. And if I write, maybe I write one thing that feels good, but it has to match with all the other things that I wrote. So all together, they don't work. So I have to conceptualize in a very, in a, in a, yeah, in, in a very um, clear way how all of these different pieces work together. Um, 
Now, if I'm trying to solve a math problem, it's kind of the same thing. I'm sitting in front of a notebook with a pencil and trying to figure out, all right, what is the next step? What tools do I know in mathematics that will allow me to make another step on this problem um, or open it up or allow me to get closer to a solution? Um, and I might try one direction. Okay, cool. Well, let me try to use calculus here. And it makes the problem more complicated. So not to say, all right, maybe I don't want to use calculus. Maybe I want to try something else. All right, well, how else can I represent this thing? Okay, cool. Let me try this. I once read about this equation. Let me go research this, right? And so it's a lot of time sitting and thinking and building internal representations of how a thing should be and being creative with it, right? You can't necessarily do what's been done before because if you're trying to solve something new, if, if it worked with what had been done before, then it'd already be solved, right? So you have to really be creative and think about the tools that you have and how to use them um, in, uh, in innovative ways in order to get to where you're going. Uh, and from that, you know, as you do that, certain things open up. There can be a sense of peace, how inspiration comes about. Sometimes you're just stuck and then you take a walk and then all of a sudden the answer just pops into your mind. You know, both of these happen in both math and music. Um, and, uh, and that's what I like to talk about. There's a lot of stuff already on the physics of sound. Um, music is basically uh, uh, waves in air and the waves and the mathematics of waves um, is very worked out and there's a whole body of knowledge around that. Sometimes when people talk about math and music, they talk about that. Okay, cool, I can talk about how waves work and I can represent those geometrically or I can represent those in terms of what are called differential equations and calculus or things like that. But I like to talk about the creative kind of subjective experience um, because I don't think it's talked about as much. Wow, really, really well said. Um, and we are moving now to our final question, uh, okay. which is uh, from Brother Rafiq and some other students. And it says, what inspired you when you were young and what continues to inspire you now? And how have your inspirations evolved, if at all? Uh -huh. um, what inspired me when I was young? I remember, so one, um, my, you know, my father being really good at mathematics um, was an inspiration because, you know, looking up to him, math was cool. You know, in a lot of school situations, being good at math means you're not a cool kid. Um, and that was true in my school as well, but I kind of didn't care because I was also trying to, you know, I was trying to impress my dad. Um, and I remember there were times when, you know, like I said, he would give me things to read. He was, uh, he was actually, um, while he was working a full-time job, he was also in school getting his, uh, his MBA, his business degree. Um, and sometimes he would bring home his, his homework in, uh, in, you know, finance math, and we'd sit and do it together. And it was like way beyond, I hadn't seen any of these symbols before, but I'm just like, you know, I love doing this, and this is a bonding experience. So he was a huge inspiration. In addition, musically, he had an enormous record collection. He had over like 3,000 albums. Um, and so there was always music in my house. He played the saxophone when he was in school, but he wasn't a professional musician. He wasn't at the level of a professional musician. Um, but when I was getting started, the reason I chose the saxophone is because we had one in the attic and we didn't have to buy one. Um, when, you know, in fourth grade, they said, you know, you should play an instrument. Um, he was like, all right, well, we'll just go get the one in the attic fixed up. We don't have to buy or rent one to save us money. And he could teach me a little bit. Um, so, uh, so, you know, so that was huge inspiration, all the music that he played, and it was all kinds of music from um, rock to funk and R&B to classical music to lots of jazz. And so all of this was just in my head. Um, so that inspired me. And I think what inspires me now is I've learned this other trick of how to be inspired by everything and how to take uh, a lesson from everything. And this is, uh, and this is, you know, I learned it when I was, you know, first in New York. Um, and I would go out to I'd go out to hear music, and sometimes I wouldn't really like the music that I was hearing. I'm thinking to myself, and I'm, you know, this is a little bit of arrogance on my part, but um, but here's how, and this is actually how I got through this because arrogance like this can hurt you in the long term. Was you know I'm like man I don't like how they're playing. I could probably play better than that. Why don't I have this gig? I should be here. And you know that's like a natural thing to feel, but I also realized that like that's not good because then I'm, I'm feeling angry and tight and upset anytime I'm going to hear music and it makes it so that I can't engage with my peers properly because I'm thinking that I'm better than them. Well, I learned this trick, which is whenever I see, any, whenever I see anybody playing music, I would say, all right, let me find something, even if I don't generally like it, right? Let me find something that, um, that they do that I can't do. Um, let me find something that 
they can do that um uh, that, that they can't that I can't do and that I want to do maybe find something that I can't do but don't want to do but can acknowledge that wow that took a lot of effort and time to put in and that that that's what they're bringing to the table or if they're just really really they just don't have it together at all it's like let me learn from what they're doing so I don't do the things that they do and I make sure that I don't have that and so those are kind of my three principles and I realized that you can apply that to everything you can apply that to anybody you meet you can apply that to any TV show you watch. You can apply that to anything you read. You can say, all right, well, what's in here that that I can't do or that I never thought about that I'd love to learn? You say, what's in here that this is really this is a really amazing. I have no interest in doing this myself, but um, but I have to acknowledge how this is beautiful and maybe learn about what world it is that you know that that generates that kind of knowledge. Or it's like, this is so bad that how can I make sure that I don't do anything like this? How can I make sure that I'm more prepared so I don't ever come on stage or, you know, represent myself in this way? And so by that, I'm inspired by absolutely everything from, you know, reading math and physics to, you know, uh, talk, you know giving talks um, and meeting interesting people to, uh, to something I might watch on Netflix. Like everything has something to teach. And so you just kind of have to put yourself in the mind space of being teachable so that you can learn. Um, as, as we close out um, and in consideration of, of the ways in which learning has, has shifted to meet the, the current pandemic and beyond, um, do you have any parting words for our students? Yeah. Um, let's see. <sighs> Learn everything you can these days. Um, find what, be very in tune with you know, what makes you happy and excited and push that, push that as far as you can. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, you got, there are always things you have to worry about. Life will always get in the way. Um, sometimes you'll have to worry about money. Sometimes you might have to worry about situations with people around you. Um, but if you can kind of find this, uh, find this inner sense of direction and power that isn't dependent on what's going on outside of you, um, and you can allow that to kind of guide and guide you and shape your life. And through that, you develop intuition, you develop preferences, and you develop an ability to be with people. That's kind of the most important thing. Um, we don't know if, you know, what we're learning in school right now is going to even work in, in 10 years. One of my friends in medical school was saying that the first, on the first day of Columbia Medical School, they told him um, half, of what we're, half of what we're telling you um, in your medical education is not going to be relevant in 10 years. The problem is we don't know which half. And that's how everything works right now. Mm -hmm. You know, computers could come and say, "Okay, cool. All these jobs you thought you were training for don't exist anymore." Mm -hmm. But you don't know which jobs that what that, that that are. So you really just have to, you know, take take internal guidance and learn how to be learn how to be with people and learn how to know what's best for you and learn how to try things and fail and get up again. Um, that's that's probably the most important thing I would say. Wow. Thank you, Tom. Tom, I said thank you very can, much. This can, is. Can you hear Brother Rafik now? No, I can't. No, you it's can't. Just, oh, listen, just to say thank you. I feel like I work for the UN. Um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Rafiq says thank you so much. We, we just we, we can't thank you enough for, for blessing us with your presence and your knowledge um, during this time. And our, our hope is that, you know, as things, as things uh, become resolved, that we can hopefully meet you in person and have you come and uh, speak with our students further. But thank Absolutely. you so much for I'll taking the time. We would, we would love to have you again. Absolutely. Sure, sure, absolutely. Thank All right. You. All right, take Thank care. So I'll Thank follow you. up with you. All right. Thank you. Peace. Bye.